So welcome to this new episode of Swift Community with uh, returning guest Donny Valls. Hello, Donny. Hey, Vincent. How are you? I'm good. And you? Doing well. Perfect. So, Donny, you've published recently a book about core data. And uh, this episode, of course, is going to be about core data. And we are going to discuss and you are going to show us how we can get started with core data on an uh, iOS project. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I actually released uh, an update for my book today. So it's it's all very... Uh... Very recent, very current, very up to date. So we will have all the links uh, in the description for you to to find out about Donny's book. Yeah. So um, let's just dive in, I guess. Unless you wanted to tell people something more about what we're going to do today. I think we can just tell people that uh, we are using a new software to record this episode, and I think the sound quality should be much better than before. But we'll see. I have high hopes for the sound quality. That's awesome. All right. So. Anytime you're going to start a new project with Core Data, you're, of course, going to want to create a new Xcode project. So let's do that right now. Uh, we're going to use the app template, and I'm just going to name it. Well, Vincent, you are very creative, I think. Let's let <laughs> you name the app. I, I don't I don't know. That's what, what's pressure. the app called? Um, what are we going to display in this app? I mean, do we want to display things like uh, like movies, maybe? Sure. Like I, I know core data. You know cool stuff. So we're gonna make a movie app. Let's say it's about movies. Maybe something like popcorn app. Popcorn app. All for it. Okay. And so when you create a new project in Xcode, we are going to use the Swift UI interface and the Swift UI app lifecycle because we are making an app for iOS 14 only so we can do everything the modern way. One thing that we're not going to do though is we're not going to check use core data. And the reason is that I want to show you how core data is set up and what is involved in setting up core data. And the default template that Xcode creates is pretty big and a lot of stuff you don't need. Or maybe, you know what, let's, Let's use core data so I can show you what I mean when I say the yeah, template we that Xcode uses is very big and very not very useful. I can tell opinion. you the last time I've used this checkbox was back in, uh, I think, 2013. Uh, it was all Objective-C and stuff. So I'm very curious to see what we get uh, nowadays. All right. Yeah, let's do it. I'm just going to save this on my desktop. And there we go. Okay, so we immediately run into a little bit of a, a compiler error. That's fine. It's because Xcode still needs to compile our project and then it will generate all the models. So the interesting bit to look at here is persistence.swift. Now, if, if you did core data before the Swift UI lifecycle, you are used to all this code being an app delegate. Is that yeah, right, Vincent? Exactly. Where it was for you? Yeah. So. Apple sort of took this approach where now you have a persistence controller in their default template. Now there is a bunch of code but if we remove the comments here, I'm sure if, if the last time you saw this, Vincent, was in 2013, you are surprised at how little code this is. Indeed. There are less yeah. objects like uh, happening here, definitely. Yeah. So we can remove even more because this right here, the preview, that's only here for Swift UI previews. We don't need those. And also this right here is pretty advanced, I would say, in memory. What that means is that we are creating a core data store that is not kept on disk. Now, if oh, you are yes. familiar with core data, uh, you know that it will persist data for you and that the data will live on your device and that will yes. you know, survive app restarts. An in-memory database doesn't do that. Again, if you did core data in the past, you probably would have set up a um, persistent uh, stack that would use a, an NS SQLite or NS in-memory store type, right? You may have seen that. I remember, you, yeah, I remember that everything was backed by SQLite files. Yes, definitely. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, so when you do it in memory, it would not use SQLite and that could lead to problems in tests. So nowadays it's recommended that you use an SQLite store type, but tell it to write the store to dev null. And what that means is just it, it will write to a location that is not on disk, but it will still use all of SQLite's features. So that's a nice way to do unit testing in a way where everything will behave identical to your production type store. But again, a feature that we are not going to use. So let's get rid of that. And now we see something very interesting for you, Vincent, because this little code to set up core data that can't be right, right? 
There is definitely yeah. There is only one object that is involved, so this NS persistent container, as I can see. Exactly. And you just need to give it a name, so in order to be able to find it on disk, I guess you have this method to load it, and uh, you just need to deal with the potential errors if there were like the files are missing or the files are corrupted or anything like that. Yep, exactly. So this NS persistent container wraps up several components like a persistent coordinator and your managed object model and a managed object context. And, and Apple packed that all into this one object that in its very most simple, straightforward form uh, just needs a name. And this name should equal your data model file. Uh, and this data model file is an XC data model uh, file that you create in your project. And this is where you define entities. Uh, now I know that this uh, is probably going to look a little bit small for people watching, but I cannot zoom this, unfortunately. So we're just going to have to deal with it. But we're going to spend most time in code anyway. Uh, so, so this is just a core data stack. And then also the stuff that Apple generates I am not a fan of that they immediately set up this view for you and you can build this project and things will immediately kind of work as long as you remove the preview provider in this case, because we removed the uh, yeah. preview provider from our uh, persistence controller as well. There we go. We can build this. And if everything went well, it succeeds. We can also run it then. And there we go. We'll our project show up eventually, or did Apple's template just not quite work? And this is why I'm not a big fan of it, because I'm just not sure if this is supposed to work or not. Yeah, you get a lot of code and uh, you're never sure, like, uh, yeah. the mistake is on your part or not. Exactly. So what we're just going to do is we're just going to ignore this ever happened, and we're going to delete everything that is not ours. Go. I think something that comes to mind, maybe it's uh, the choice that uh, they did on the template. So it's called a persistence controller. But if you have been doing like using UI kit, actually, this has nothing to do with a UI view controller. It's more a controller in terms of like backend and uh, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's a little bit confusing, I think. And especially since core data is so simple to set up nowadays, why not do it yourself? It's It's not that complicated. So we're just going to remove everything we don't need. Say text. Hello world. I want to make sure that the project is fine. There we go. Hello world on screen. Everything good. There's one last interesting thing that we would have done ourselves if we would have set up core data from scratch. And that's this line right here. Now, if you want to use core data in a, in a Swift UI app, you're of course going to have to pass a managed object context. I'll explain what that is in a second. You have to pass a managed object context somewhere because that is what you use to fetch data. And Swift UI, every view has an environment um, key path, managed object context. And if you're going to use fetch results, the property wrapper, a very convenient way to fetch all objects that respond to changes, you're going to have to set your managed object context on the environment. So that's what this code right here does. Okay, yeah. And I think anyway, it's much cleaner than uh, directly using the, the shared instance as we would have done uh, back in the yeah, old days. Yeah, exactly. So this will at least give you some form of dependency injection. Whether you like environment or not, let's not get into that discussion because <laughs> there are many people who prefer environment, people who think it's very hard to test. And I mean, you can, of course, there's nothing stopping you from deleting this line and passing your persistence controller to your content view. However, your fetch requests will not work. So if you want to use the fetch request, property you need this yeah okay so we were going to make an app that's going to display movies so let's uh create a movie entity and um yeah what kind of fields are we going to add to it vincent we're definitely going to add a title of course a title what else definitely uh maybe a, a year of release release year sounds good and maybe so i'm trying to think it so we have different types uh maybe a writing this way we would have something uh, numerical Sounds good. So we're going to use an uh, integer 16, 32, integer 64. And we can pick whichever size we want. Maybe a double uh, because often you find you have like, uh, I don't know, IMDB, I know you have 7.6 or that kind of things. Sounds good. So we, we're going to store decimal values so we can have fractional ratings. So that sounds fine. Let's, let's start with these three. Yeah. I think that's a good beginning. Okay, so, okay, what's next? So the next thing is we are going to want to build some way to add movies to our store. And then after that, we're going to build something to fetch these movies. How does that sound? It sounds nice. Yeah, it, it seems like core data, it's meant to persist data. So you need ways to both update or insert new values. And then of course, we need a way to display them on the UI so that the user can 
interact with the values. So that makes sense. Exactly. Exactly. So let's um, go ahead and do this. Let's just create a struct add movie view. And that's going to be a view. And we're going to make three state properties on it that match uh, the fields that we wanted to add to our movie. So we're going to make a title string. So basically we're it's going to be a, a, a simple form to just like uh, input a new a new movie. Yeah, so release here. I think I made that a string. Uh, we're, we're going to keep that as a string. We're not, we're not going to make a date and everything because I don't want to make a date picker. I don't feel it's like going to be much simpler this way. Yeah. Exactly. And we had the rating, which is a double. Okay, so add a body and let's let's also copy this because I want to have a view context in here later. In our body, we're going to have a little stack, fee stack. Yes, and then a text field. And the title key for that is just going to be movie title. Bind that to dollar title. And before I forget, let's throw in some default values. So then we have the same logic for the release year. Right. And then maybe, I don't know, for the writing, maybe we could go for a slider actually to input a double value. Sounds good. Slider. Uh, let's see, we can also add a label. Yeah. So let's see, this value is going to be dollar. Rating and then we're going to use a close range with between zero and ten. Zero through ten, yeah, seems good. And then and then the label, the label, text, uh, rating. There we go. And then last but not least. Oh yes, we need the button to say that we are done. Exactly. Save this movie. There we go. An action. Okay, so now we're going to have to do a couple things. We're going to have to create an instance. Help me out here, Vincent. What are we doing um, wrong? It seems. Wait, is it? Do we need to? Maybe give it just wants a raw string. Maybe I don't know. Let's, let's try this. Maybe it wants a closure. Yeah. Oh, okay. It wants a closure that returns a view. Apparently, I would have expected it to be like decorated with uh, auto closure, but uh, yeah, maybe in the well, future. Who knows? I like the formatting like this better. Okay, so save this movie. So we're gonna have to create an instance of our movie object that we just defined in the data model. We're gonna have to assign its properties and then we're gonna have to persist it to core data. Now, what's interesting is that when you define a uh, entity in the data model editor, core data has this option to generate the code for this entity for you. So right here in the data model inspector, you can see code gen class definition. That means that it's going to define the entire class. Other options are manual none. That means that we're going to write a managed object subclass on our own, or we can have it generate a category or extension. It would add all the stored properties in an extension. I remember that one. Yeah. So if you're familiar with Swift, this is going to sound very silly because Swift extensions cannot hold stored properties. So how is it possible that apparently Cordata is allowed to generate something a little bit like extension movie, and then it adds these properties? Well, which is weird, right? Because this I, is totally... If I remember right, like in Objective-C, I think it was just like headers and then the actual implementation was generated like either at runtime or at compile time. So basically, I would say compute properties when you are in Swift. Yeah, so, so in Swift, this compiles to Objective-C and I believe that that is probably why this is fine. Uh, the at N is managed. It's a very special treatment from the Swift compiler. So I'm sure there's a lot of magic going on to make this work because it eventually compiles down to Objective C, where this is all not a problem. So even though this is illegal Swift code, yeah, it's legal in the context of Cordata because of this at N as managed decorator, because this is not a property wrapper, even though it looks like one. That's something that's art coding into the compiler. Pretty much, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so we are going to let Cordata generate our class definitions because that is just the easiest way to go about it. Okay, so what we do now is we're going to say, we're gonna create a movie instance and it's gonna be an instance of movie. And in Core Data, every object that you create, every managed object that you create is tied to a context. And that context will hold exactly one instance of that object. So in this case, we're gonna create an instance of movie. And no matter how often we fetch this movie, if we fetch it using this view context that we have right here, yeah. it's always gonna be the same class instance. So no matter how many copies you have, there will always be one 
instance of a particular movie. So you can have 20 different movies, but for each of those 20 movies, you're always going to have one instance, no, many how, no matter how many times you fetch those movies. So the very next thing to do is assign this view context to the context. I'm going to go ahead and compile the project because it's going to complain, cannot find movie in scope. Now this looks weird, but now suddenly the build does succeed. Do you see that? Like it will yeah. be fine. The reason is that I tried to build the project earlier when movie wasn't generated and Xcode kind of trips up over this. Maybe if we clean the project, it'll go away. It's always a bit of a trial and error, hit and miss, clean the right data, cleaning things. So I'm just going to leave the error here. We know it's fine. Yeah, because this actually like the movie. So is there like uh, a file that is generated or is it just something that's happening in the build phases and uh, it's not part of our project? So there is a file generated, but we cannot see it and we're not supposed to interact with it. Uh, the okay. file is stored in the right data actually. So okay. we can't, we can actually just fire up a terminal real quick and go to the derived data folder. And then right here, you'll see that we have this popcorn app build, intermediates popcorn app build, debug iPhone simulator popcorn build, derived sources, core data generated popcorn app. And, and we have the two then, files. Okay, yeah. Yes. That's so here is yeah. our movie. So you can see that core data generates the empty class, exposes it to objective C. And yeah, so it shows that awesome. as far as our like our project is concerned, the source of truth is the file that holds the model, and that's what should be of course like committed and uh, versioned in yeah. a good commit. Yeah. So exactly. So this generated file, you do not use it anywhere. So okay. So now we have created the movie. We assigned it to our view context. We have the title. We have the release here. We have the rating assigned. And now the last step is to save the managed object context. So try view context dot save catch. And we're just going to print if, if anything goes wrong. Let's see, this should build just fine. And it does. And we're going to run the project and nothing happens because we haven't created a way to present this view this just view, yeah. yet. Right, so I'm going to create a view stack here. Uh, we're going to add a list later. So first, we're just going to add to the top of the view a button that says add new movie. And we're going to need a little state here. This adding movie equals false. Setting movie equals true. And on this, we're going to add a... Uh, Some kind of observer, I guess. Yes. We're actually going to add a sheet, but I'm going to create a new file real quick. Just to help Xcode a little bit with auto completion in the other file. So I present a sheet. This presented is going to be binding to is adding movie. And the content will be our new movie view. Add movie view. Okay, okay. Okay, so now we should have the button. And when we click it, yes. we have our sheet. There we go. Movie title, test movie, released in 2021. Give it the maximum rating, save this movie. Okay, well, nothing blew up. Things look okay. No I error printed in the console either. Exactly. So I guess our movie was saved. So the next thing we'll just do is build that list. Build that list, we're going to need uh, a list of movies. And to do that, we are going to use an add fetch request property wrapper. And so there are a lot of different versions of this. And the version that I like is the one that takes a fetch request. Okay. Simply because that means that I'm going to have to do the, the least amount of configuration in my view. I can also say fetch this entity and sort it like that, or fetch this entity, uh, sort it like that, apply this predicate to, to filter out everything and use this kind of an animation to show new data. But I don't indeed, like all you that. would be like encoding a lot of logic in the view. So Exactly. So I'm just going to use this fetch request here, uh, but we're going to have to find a place to to add that. So I'm just going to 
create another new file. I'm going to call it movie.fetch request or plus fetch request. We're going to extend movie here. And we're going to give it a static var uh, fetch all. And that is going to be an NS fetch request. So this is not the same as the uh, fetch request property wrapper. Because this creates a request that core data can execute and the fetch request property wrapper creates a property wrapper that does all kinds of other extra things. Our fetch request is going to be generic over movie and it's just going to be movie.fetch request. Okay, so it's something that's already provided by core data. Yeah, so the generated code that you just saw adds a fetch request function to a generated entity. So this would be enough to fetch all of the movies. However, uh, if, if you know a little bit about how databases tend to work, this does not guarantee any kind of sorting, oh, which yes. is going to be a problem if you want this list to be somewhat stable, right? You don't want to shuffle things around. Typically, things like SQLite will sort of use some kind of caching, so it kind of looks stable, but it really is not guaranteed. So we're going to make this a computed property and we are going to say request equals fetch request and we are going to have to specify this because there are multiple overloads for fetch requests and core data or swift compiler tends to get confused uh, which overload you want if you don't specify the generic and so we're going to apply uh, sort descriptors to this request and we need to create an instance of NS sort descriptor. We can pass multiple, so that's why I'm passing an array. And we're going to say, take this key path, let's sort on title, and we're going to sort ascending. Oh, yeah, it's super nice to see that we have now uh, some kind of uh, convenience initializer that takes in a key path, because I remember like when it was just a string, and you had to be very careful that you didn't make any spelling mistakes. So we can just pass it a Swift key path, and that's very nice. This is one of the many things that Apple has been adding over the years to kind of make core data a little bit better with, with Swift. Uh, okay, so we have our fetch request now. We, we request everything, so we don't specify a predicate. We could uh, add a predicate to you know do a search or Maybe only like, get movies. We only want movies whose writing is over five, for instance. That would be an example. Exactly, yeah. So so in that case, you would define a predicate. We can look at that in a bit if you want, but let's, let's do the yeah. simple thing first. Uh, okay, so we have this. Now we have the content view. That's where we pass the fetch request. So we're gonna use just movie.fetchall. We've encapsulated all the fetch logic into our computed That's static property. property. Yeah. And so we're gonna say for movies, and this is gonna be fetch results. And then we say movie. Output. So this is how we would fetch the data using everything that Swift UI provides. And then we can say, let's take this list here going to show movies and we're just going to show a little v stack with some text and then the text is going to be the movie title title year and writing yeah let's give the, the title font of a large or just normal title yeah so it reads better yeah it's just a little bit bigger than the rest and we're just going to add a movie dot rating with the normal font. So Cordata generates models where all properties are optional. Okay. So I assume that this is K, okay, yeah. Swift UI's type inference is not perfect. So we said this is indeed a movie. Yes. So what are we doing wrong right now? Is it this? A list of movies. Mm, maybe the writings. I mean, it's a double, but... Uh... Oh, that could be. Let's let's comment that out. Let's see what happens if we only. Oh, that was yeah, it. That is it. So, how are we going to display this double, Vincent? You are much better at Swift UI than I am. I guess we can do something like uh, string interpolation. Sure. So we have to interpolate. I guess the entire exp yeah, including the new coalescing operator. That's the quick and dirty way to do it. So I guess we have to put in a value ah, of zero wait, now. Okay. So yeah, I guess in a real app, of course, we would deal like much more thoroughly with uh, default values. Yes, and so also you can see that. Um, because this oh, yes. has got everything to do with Objective-C because this can be represented in Objective-C and there's a sort of a default value that makes a lot of sense. We get zero as a default, so we don't even need to unwrap the optional. However, the more exciting part is, is that- Is something is happening I, on the UI? Yes, so if I go back to the simulator and I make it bigger, you can see that we now have this test movie right here. So that's a fantastic start. 
And now we're going to add another movie. Uh, what's your favorite movie, Vincent? Um, I am looking at some uh, some movies uh, soundtrack in front of me. Maybe we can go for Blade Runner. Blade Runner. When was that released? Because I don't know. It's old. I guess it's in. I would say in the nineties, but I'm not even sure about it. Like at 1990, and of course it is a pretty awesome movie, right? Yes. Okay, so let's save this movie and see. Oh, it happened. There it is. So this is all we needed to do to build an app that persists our movies. Because if we now close the app and we really close it Give like it that. And start it again. We see we still have our data just laying around. And do this, and do this all day. It updates as soon as you add another movie. So let's also do, uh, oh, what's another cool movie? Um, what do we have in front of me? I also have Escape from New York. Escape from New York. This one is old, or it's also, I guess, maybe something like 85 or 86. Even, Even 1986. Can... Is it as good as Blade Runner, or? Yeah, it's also good. I kind of like it. Okay, okay, so let's put it here. Not Blade Runner good, but kind of good. Save it. There we go. It's totally saved. And we have some Swift UI layout problems. I'm not great with Swift UI, so I don't know what's going on. I do know how to fix it, though. Anybody watching this is really good at Swift UI. Don't laugh at me, please. <laughs> I mean, life coding is also always very hard. Oh, there yeah. we go. It's fixed. It's perfectly fine. Okay, so what do we want to see? Like this is the basics. This is the simplest way to use Cordata, just with a fetch request in your view, with a little extension to encapsulate your your data. Yeah, the simplest Cordata stack ever made since iOS ten. What's really good? Nice. We see like the we could, we could see the overhead of using Cordata. It's uh, I mean it's pretty small. Like uh, re more recently, I've been using uh, Realm. And uh, it seems it's now like kind of on the same kind of basis, I guess. It's a different philosophy in terms of how you manage your code. But in terms like of overhead, I think it's definitely comparable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really gotten a lot better. Um, like I used Cordata back on iOS 6 or 7. And it just wasn't great back then because you had to create like a bunch of objects and, you know, do a lot of bookkeeping and pay a lot of attention to everything. Now you still have to pay attention to threading, for example. Like you cannot just throw managed object context from one thread to another, which I'm pretty sure Realm has the same limitations where if you create a Realm on one thread and pass it to another, it's it's the instance is going to crash because Realm is not thread safe. Core data also is not thread safe. So if you want to use something in a background thread, you're going to have to make a background context or properly cast to the correct thread. Yeah, and I guess it's not like a Realm or a Core data issue. It's just like something that's hard when you're doing a database because you have all these uh, things about data integrity and uh, there is basically like no magic that can save you, save you there. No, like... You can do a lot and a lot is being done, but at some point you are just going to have to also be a little bit careful with, with how you thread your code and how you use dispatch queues and all that. Well, I think we've covered quite a, quite a nice cup because I mean, this is a video of course intended for people who are getting started and uh, want to learn about core data. So we've seen uh, how to set up the core data stack. We've seen how to create an entity. We've seen how to add entities then to the, is it good to say the data the database when you talk about core data? Or yes, the data no. model? Um, so, so core data is so you're going to have a very bad time if you think of core data as an SQLite database. Now I make the mistake of calling it a database every once in a while. I find it better to refer to it as a store because core data at its core is called a graph management exactly. tool, and persistence graph, is just part that. of it. Yeah, and persistence is just a part of that. Like. It can actually also write, for example, to an XML file instead of SQLite or to some binary representation that I don't know exactly what it is. Apple just calls it binary. Uh, so SQLite is just an implementation detail of it. So calling it a database is technically not correct, but, you know, it's try to call that it the store. For, for an app, yeah. Yeah, I just try to call it like the core data store, persist it to the store. You know, that's that's good enough for me. <laughs> I think that's a good way also of like keeping like the, the abstraction layer at the good or the intended level by the Apple engineers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like Apple never intended for people to, you know, 
deeply, deeply tweak your SQLite queries like you might do if you were to use something like GRDB or directly interface with SQLite, because then you can, of course, like highly optimize your queries and do all kinds of crazy joins and uh, sub queries and all that stuff. And Cordata handles all that for you, so you shouldn't worry about it too much. You can inspect what Cordata does with your queries, and you can kind of optimize your app, like at a later stage where you're like, hey, I want to, you know, see if if I can make the queries better. But you cannot directly interface with the SQLite, and that is very much on purpose by the Apple engineers. That makes sense here that they would treat this uh, as private data and then we just use like, we've seen it, we, we use the key path, we use the predicate system that they've given us and then they take care of translating all of this into the low level. So SQLite uh, queries or I guess XPath if you have XML and uh, that kind of things. Yep, yeah, exactly. Well, I think that uh, was a really good episode that we've just uh, done together. So of course, if you want to know more about Corel Data, I can only recommend that uh, you check out Donny's book. So once again, it's going to be a link in the description and I guess the book is appearing somewhere on the screen at this moment. Thank you, Donny, for coming back on this uh, on this episode. As always, great, uh, great explanation. Thanks, Vincent. It was, it was fun being here again. And well, you know how it goes. So liking, subscribing, sharing, all that kind of thing. If you have some particular like uh, feedback about Core Data, please say it in the comments. I can tell you that me on the iOS memes account, I've made a lot of fun of Core Data being complicated and stuff. But I've seen now that uh, since the last time I've used it, it actually has gotten a lot more better. So maybe I won't be like uh, making so much much fun of it in the future and uh, well see you next time for another video bye